Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. I'm Emmanuel, I'm a Boeing 737 pilot and a member of PMDG's tech team. In today's video let's talk a little bit about the bleed air system of the Boeing 737. I've seen quite a couple of questions in my channel about it and so let's have a look at it in a little bit more detail. So, the Boeing 737 bleed air system is not all that complicated. However, be aware that everything that's said in this video is only for entertainment purposes and not for any uh, real aviation uh, study purposes. Alright, so let's go for it. Um, air for the bleed air system can be supplied by the engines, APU or an external air card. And the APU or external air card supplies air to the bleed air duct prior to engine start and after engine start the bleed engine bleed air system is normally used. Now the APU is able to provide bleed air as well up to 17,000 feet if it is not providing electrical load and up to 10,000 feet if the APU has to provide both electrical and bleed air. Now for the purpose of uh, today's video, let's talk about the normal operation of the system and how it actually works, as well as a little bit of the system backgrounds. It is very important not to confuse the bleed air system with the pressurization system or the air conditioning system, which are basically reliant on one another, but independent systems. So for today, we'll focus only on this panel that we see on screen over here and what the different switches and lights are doing and how the overall system works. You can see I've already got up the bleed air system schematic of the uh, 600 and 700 on the left hand side here as well as of the um, 800 and 900 which are basically very sim similar to one another. The only real difference is you have an additional recirculation fan on the panel up here. Now Let's focus on the 600 and 700 since those are released at the time of recording. The following systems do rely on the bleed air system for operation. That's air conditioning and pressurization, wing and engine thermal anti-icing, engine starting, hydraulic reservoir pressurization, water tank pressurization and, if installed on the aircraft, the nitrogen generation system. Now PMDG does not have the nitrogen generation system installed on the aircraft, but you would simply have to imagine an additional um, source over here in the system schematic where it says two hydraulic reservoir and two water tank there would be another one two nitrogen generation system so this looks pretty complicated doesn't it all right it's not all that problematic first of all we have a simplified look of the system available on the panel itself. So we can see over here the left hand side is basically fed from the left engine bleed and from the APU bleed which we can see in the schematic down here. So we have our engine and we have our APU providing bleed air into the system. And then the right hand system is fed by the right engine and they are separated by the isolation valve. Now. Let's have a quick look in the system description and see which path the bleed air is basically flowing. Bleed air can be taken from the 5th and from the ninth stage of the compressor section in the engine. The 5th stage basically is the low pressure stage and the ninth stage is the high pressure stage. And basically the 5th stage is usually used to obtain bleed air from the engine and that is sufficient during pretty much all operation in takeoff, climb and most cruising conditions. And ninth stage air is then only needed when you are in uh, low thrust situations, for example, during descent. That's why in here we can see our check valve letting air flow from the fifth stage into the system and not back into the opposite. While at the ninth stage down here, we do have a high stage valve that opens and closes as required. From here, the bleed air is basically going straight away to the engine cowl anti-ice. So cowl thermal anti-icing basically is the engine anti-ice. And you can see that this is basically always available as long as there is air coming from the fifth or the ninth stage. 
from here on, next up is the bleed trip sensors, where we have two around the engine bleed air valve. Now the engine bleed air valve is the valve which we are operating with the bleed air switches like this. So that's the valve we are controlling here. From there on, the airflow is continuing. We have a way to the engine start valve up here and then to the wing thermal anti-icing. From there, air is fed into the bleed air duct and to the uh, water tank and hydraulic reservoir and the um, nitrogen generation system as applicable. And then it's fed directly to the pack valve. So that is basically the flow that we see on the actual panel over here where you have air from either the um, engine number one or the APU bleed air and then we can see by following the schematic that it's going to the wing anti-ice and then right towards the pack. Now next up is the isolation valve that is located just next uh, to it and the isolation valve is operated by a AC power and there is basically a very easy way to know how the isolation valve is positioned when the switch is in auto. So I'm putting it into auto now and basically when the rest of the panel is configured as normal then the isolation valve is closed. So with the bleeder switch is on and the pack switch is in auto the isolation valve is going to be closed. The, the same accounts with the uh, pack switches in high by the way. Now if you turn any of these switches, so either a pack switch or an engine bleeder switch into off, then the isolation valve is automatically going to open when the switch is in the auto position. The APU bleeder switch does not affect the automatic positioning of the isolation valve. The isolation valve itself, as you can see on the a uh, system schematic here is separating the left side of the bleed air system from the right side. And do note that external air conditioning is flowing in from the uh, right hand side of the system over here. So in order for the external air conditioning to be able to provide air to the left pack, the isolation valve has to be open. The good news about that is when external air conditioning is connected, you, the pilot needs to turn off the packs manually in order to um, provide uh, in order to protect the system from uh, basically from breaking down due to external air coming in and remember what I just said with the packs and off and the isolation of an auto it is going to open up automatically now for operation on the ground the isolation valve is always going to be open anyway as uh, part of the normal procedures where you would open the isolation valve after engine shutdown and then only set it back to auto after engine start has commenced. So external air is always available for both sides with the normal system um, configuration as you would do it following the normal procedures. Now going on from here we have a couple of warning lights available on the system. The pack tri uh, trip off light is not all that interesting for the bleed air system for us, that's why we are not going to talk about that one. But the other two are. We have the uh, bleed trip off and the wing body overheat. The bleed trip off light is going to be triggered when the um, bleed trip sensors sense either an excessive temperature or an exceedance of a predefined pressure limit inside the um, engine bleed air system and what's happening then is the bleed air valve is going to close automatically and the bleed trip of light is going to illuminate when this happens. Now when that happens to you pull up the quick reference handbook run the bleed trip of non-normal checklist and it is going to give you directions on how to fix the problem. The next one is a little bit more serious. That's the wing body overheat light. Basically we have several sensors installed along critical parts of the engine bleed air system. Which are measuring if there is any hot air 
coming from the engine bleeds leaking out of the system. And keep in mind we have the bleed airlines running along some very sensitive systems there in the aircraft. So if you get some couple hundred degrees hot air leaking out in positions where it's not supposed to be, that can be a pretty serious issue. Again, if the wing body overheat light illuminates, then run the associated non-normal checklist and it is going to direct you to isolate the problem and basically configure the airplane for flight with a single bleed air system only. Note that this does come with some pretty severe uh, limitations, so that is not a failure to take lightly. We can have a look at the distribution of the um, wing body overheat ducts if we go on in the AFCA. We can see this down here. Basically from the left hand side, uh, the left sensor is allocated on the left engine strut, the left leading uh, edge inbound, so that's the one we see over here. The left hand air conditioning bay, the keel beam and the bleed duct from the APU. So here again, the APU is part of the left-hand side of the system. So as we can see in the schematic, anything that uh, is leaking coming from the APU and the keel beam, as well as anything from the left-hand engine here, is going to cause the left wing body overheat light to illuminate. And then basically on the right-hand side, we have sensors in the right engine strut, the right inboard wing leading edge, and the right-hand air conditioning bay that might cause these to illuminate. Then going on a little bit in the system, we have the uh, dual bleed light, the one located up here. And the dual bleed light is going to illuminate whenever APU bleed air valve is open and the position of the engine bleed air switches and isolation valve would permit a possible back pressure of air towards the APU. And thrust has to be limited to idle when the dual bleed light is illuminated, otherwise you can significantly damage your APU. Now, basically, as we can see in the system schematics over here, there is a check valve that's supposed to um, prevent air from flowing back towards the APU. However, with um, strong pressure being in the system, as in the uh, bleed air valves being open and a high thrust setting, or even any thrust setting higher than idle, this may break down and you can actually completely break the APU with this. Now, you might be a little bit surprised that a modern aircraft does not have an automatic protection against this, but that's how it is. And uh, that's why we have the dual bleed light to prevent this from happening. So, it is normal to see the dual bleed light come on in a normal operation. So, if I'm just going to turn off the um, light test switch over here. As soon as the APU bleed uh, is turned on and the left engine bleed is turned on, the dual bleed light is going to illuminate and provided that the isolation valve is open, the same goes for the right engine bleed air switch. So as we can see over here, if the isolation valve is closed, then the dual bleed light is going to uh, shut off because right now the right hand or the number two engine bleed is going to uh, provide bleed air just towards the right pack and the right uh, wing anti-ice but the isolation valve is stopping it from flowing into the left hand side of the system where the APU bleed would be located. Alright, so then we have our duct pressure indicators up here. Right now we have our APU running and Let's use that in order to have a look at the duct pressures. With the APU bleed air being switched on and the isolation valve being open, we are getting pressure into both systems. Now, in order to start the engines, you want to have a duct pressure of approximately 30 psi at least. So as you can see right now, with the packs operating in auto, the APU is not able to supply sufficient bleed air for the engines to start. But when we turn the packs off, Then we can now see that um, 
Duck pressure is actually reducing up here, but it is now available for engine start. If you were to conduct an engine crossbleed start, then basically what you would be doing is um, to configure the airplane with the APU bleed off, of course, and um, now you would increase engine thrust in order for the duct pressure needles to increase to 30 psi. And at 30 psi you would have sufficient duct pressure to start the other engine for an engine cross bleed start. It is normal to see the duct pressure needles separate from one another. So in normal operation it might happen that uh, one engine is providing a little bit more pressure than the other and since in normal operation the isolation valve is going to be closed with the engines running, it can happen that one needle is showing a higher or a lower pressure than the other. Now, as we can see on the system schematic up here, this is what it looks like and basically a split of like 10-15 psi can happen and it's something that doesn't have to be recorded in the tag lock if it doesn't become excessive. So if one system would provide, for example, 10 PSI and the other 60, that's definitely something to note. But for the rest of it, there are certain limitations of how big the split can be in the engineering manuals. So that's something that the engineers could take care of if required. But in most cases, based on my personal experience, when you see a duct pressure difference of, for example, 10 PSI, you tell the engineer after the flight and they are going to look up if that's normal or not and in the vast majority of cases a certain split is absolutely normal and can be tolerated. So this basically concludes our look at the engine bleed air system already. So keep in mind for you in order to start the engines you have to have bleed air available this can come either from the APU or from an external unit. And as we can see on the system schematics here, there is no valve that would prevent any air to uh, go right to the uh, starter valve. However, a procedure is available in the supplementary procedures engine section in the FCOM that is going to provide you with guidance on how to start the engines with an external air source. So, this, con this concludes our look at the bleed air system. I would like to thank you very much for being with us. If you found this one interesting, I would appreciate a small donation through the Buy Me A Coffee link that you can find in the video description below. Until then, thank you very much for joining and I'm looking forward to see you all in the virtual skies.